handle the truth. The Denise Simon Experience. The Truth Matrix. Vetting, exposing, drilling down to the truth. Talk America Radio. US. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was somebody on Fox News that so caught my attention, and mostly because I had read a, re- a remarkable summary by Josh Myers in um, Politico about uh, Operation Cassandra. So um, I reached out to Derek Maltz, and uh, Derek is the former agent in charge of Special Operations Division the DEA, law enforcement, 28 years. I think he's now retired. Isn't that right, Derek? That's right, Denise. I'm retired since uh, 2014. Well, you know what? Thank thank you for what you have done. I, I, I find probably, I know a couple of people that are former DEA, and I find them to be probably the most frustrated people within government and law enforcement. So I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I really believe that. I have got zero tolerance for anything narcotics. I, I just watch the destruction, and I, I know that what I see is a sliver of what um, all of you guys in, in DEA have seen. So, you know, thank you for what all that you did and attempted to do and those kind of things. But I'm going to throw you a curveball to kind of start off because I would say that Mexico, while they have been uh a fair weathered partner to the united states when it comes to all things drug trafficking and narcotics we've got to go back to what three or four years ago now time does pass when um they released a what i would call a murderer and that and and didn't bother to necessarily tell the united states and that's uh carol quintero did i get that right Derek? that's correct yes (laughs) rcq is uh major drug trafficker who's been around forever and unfortunately was very involved with the murder, the kidnapping, the murder, the torture of Enrique Camarena mm-hmm. back in like 1985. And the fact that he was released, just overwhelming, uh, just disappointment. Uh, but you know what? Just like many of these guys, like they, they get free for a while, but he'll be caught and he'll be in jail in the U.S. in the, in the near future. I so want you to be right on that one. Um, As I said, I got a couple of friends that are former DEA, and and the Kiki case is is one that I think took the wind out of their sails for a very long time. Um, Derek, you have uh, certainly given some TV appearances in congressional testimony. And I I, I see frustration in your face and and in your voice. Um, Is... Are those that need to be policy makers and um, policy managers, are they really understanding the work of the DEA? No, I mean, Denise, I mean, a lot of people in the Beltway tend to be very self-serving. They look out for their personal interests and their personal bank accounts. I mean, my brother died in Afghanistan in 2003 during Operation Enduring Freedom. Mm. He came back in a body bag and... Ever since that day, my life has personally changed, and my focus has changed as well. Fortunately for me, I was able to uh, get a job at the Special Operations Division in 2005, and I was able to work with the multiple agencies and was able to see a lot of things that happen in government, some good, some bad. And honestly, it's really disappointing to see some of the people that are in the beltway that actually get paid a lot of money by the taxpayers and just, I absolutely just don't really care about public safety. And so me personally, I mean, I basically try to do the best I can. I'm still involved with national security issues and public safety issues. And I have a lot of friends in law enforcement. I communicate with law enforcement every day and will continue to do anything I can to push the national security uh, priorities to the public. Um, Derek, we've got an awful lot of laws on the books, and I would think that, you know, where we are today, those laws are really sufficient, but it comes down to the prosecutors and the DA 
uh, in leniency. Is is that part of um, the the big frustration of DEA? Well, I mean, the laws in this country are very antiquated. Number one. Just as an example, when it comes to emerging technology, the laws on the books are going back into the 60s. 1968 was the law on wiretapping, for example. Mm -hmm. And when they came up with the law, it was based on a rotary telephone that was sitting in somebody's house in the middle of middle America that was never going to change, that was always in the same name, and the whole community would use the phone, right? But today, when you're dealing with advanced encryption and emerging technology, it's very difficult for law enforcement to do their job to protect America if they don't have the ability to infiltrate the communications. So that's just an example. I mean, everything is moving so quickly with the globalization of the Internet and law enforcement moves so damn slow. So it puts the law enforcement professionals at a real disadvantage. Plus. The resources aren't available. You know, this stuff is very expensive to get the capabilities that are needed to go after the bad guys. You know, the budgets aren't there and the legal processes aren't there. So it becomes a huge disadvantage to the law enforcement agencies that are actually trying very hard to do the right thing. DEA has a has a global reach. Correct. I mean, it's just not about, you know, the south the southwest border and, you know, pockets of of uh, criminal narcotic activity in L.A. or Oakland or Atlantic City or Miami. I mean, it's truly a a global thing. Um, right. And I don't I, the DEA, I'm sorry. The, I was just, the DEA has like over 60. Uh, well, actually, over 90 offices in over 60 countries. And the DEA has the largest law enforcement investigative presence overseas. And the thing that everyone has to realize is that the command and control elements that want to destroy our country are all foreign. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to have an impact for public safety, you have to be able to move quickly around the world. And DEA has developed tremendous relationships with our counterparts over the last like 40 years. And there's a lot of trust and there's a lot of relationships that have been built up from from counterparts that were maybe colonels that are now running the entire law enforcement agencies overseas. So the DEA agents that worked there, you know, 20 years ago and got elevated through the ranks into the senior executive ranks now have these relationships that are unbelievable. So, yeah, to answer your question, the DEA is very global. And when you're looking at the worldwide drug situation, you have to look at it from a global perspective. You can't look at it as a local, just local issue. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand how, you know, it's manufactured, how it's moving into America, and how the monies are moving back outside the country. This isn't just a matter of getting um, the poppy and the heroin out of Afghanistan. I mean, we've got a whole China-Korea component. We've got a Lebanon component. We've got an Africa component component and i derek i would argue that um the normal people sitting at home in their living room watching the six o'clock news have no concept of the of the the smuggling the traffic lanes the creativity the the shipments i mean we all think okay everything's great because uh, the Coast Guard just seized two tons of methamphetamines, and we think, oh, okay, that's cool. We're, you know, uh, we're we're chomping away at this, but we're really not, are we? Right. So that's a great point. So let me give you an example. When you talk about China, China is absolutely involved in a chemical warfare against America right now, and we need to wake up quickly because they're dumping fentanyl, pure fentanyl, in our country every single day of the week and they're using the Mexican cartels to distribute the fentanyl, which is killing our citizens at an alarming rate. In 2017, there's, there's 72,000 Americans that have died from drug overdose, mm -hmm. right? If you think about it, it's 200 a day. On top of that, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news. We just had a recent outbreak in Chicago, New York, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, uh, our nation's capital of this K2 and the spice synthetic drugs yep. where people yep. are bleeding from their eyes, bleeding from their ears, 
and they're dropping like flies all over America. And this stuff is coming from China. So we have a like a chemical bombing of America from these these chemicals that are coming from China. On top of that, you have the Mexican cartels making billions of dollars, dropping drugs all over America, methamphetamine, heroin, marijuana, cocaine. But here's another thing that the public is not paying attention to. And I'm glad you brought this up. So you have like multi-ton shipments of cocaine that are leaving South America every single day of the week. Mm -hmm. And these shipments are going to Africa. And people are like, well, who cares? It's Africa. No, you should care because it's Al-Qaeda, it's Hezbollah, it's other terrorist groups that are now tapping into the resources of the drug trafficking activities to support their agendas. Because the big thing, Denise, is that terrorists are increasingly turning to crime and criminal networks for their funding. And drug trafficking is generating billions of dollars around the world. So the public needs to understand that the drug issues are not just public health issues. They are national security issues as well. Yeah, um, I, I read a book not too long ago titled Harpoon. Have you had a chance to read that one, Derek? No, I have not seen that. It, uh, I, I, <laughs> I read the book in probably a day and a half. It was a remarkable book. Um, and... Then I read the Josh Myers article in Politico about Operation Cassandra. I would argue that Operation Cassandra was probably one of the larger unspoken of scandals in the Obama administration. Um, would that be on your short list as well? Yes. I mean, so let me just talk about that quickly. So Project Cassandra was the DEA's effort to go after Hezbollah's cocaine and money laundering activities. What we identified was a very large um, trade-based money laundering scheme that was basically supporting Hezbollah. And so in 2006, when the war between Hezbollah and Israel broke out, obviously they needed cash, right? Mm -hmm. So they came, up with a, they came up with a scenario involving used cars where the way the scheme went down, Denise, is they, they were sending multi-ton quantities of cocaine into West Africa. The drugs would be sold in Europe and different parts of the world. The monies would be collected, transported via Middle East and Korea, right back to um, Beirut, Lebanon. When the money arrived in Beirut, there would be Hezbollah militants controlling the movement of the cash into the money exchange houses. And then in the money exchange houses, they'd be routed through banks in Lebanon. And then the money would go to corresponding accounts in America Mm -hmm. And the used car businesses all over our country would take the cash out and go actually to auto auctions and different events in America, buy used cars and send them down to West Africa itself. When they sold in West Africa, they'd get 20%, 25% profit on all the cars. But the problem was the monies that were being generated were actually helping to support Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And we identified hundreds of businesses around America. Unfortunately. Because of our information sharing problems that we have ongoing in America, we can only include 30 of the 300 businesses in our action that we did in the Southern District of New York. And so basically, nobody really seemed to put an effort in. Like the Obama administration, I don't want to pick on the Obama administration, but like Bruce Orr, you see him all over the news these days, and him and his wife had the secret mission to take out President Trump and doing mm -hmm. all this stuff with Christopher Steele mm -hmm. and Glenn Simpson with the whole, you know, Fusion GPS and the the, mm -hmm. the initiative uh, paid for by the Hillary Clinton campaign to take out the president. But the reality was, is Bruce Orr was the head of the U.S. government's threat mitigation working group, which is part of which was part of President Obama's strategy to go after transnational organized crime. Hezbollah was identified as one of the top targets in America. And unfortunately, we couldn't get our agencies to work together. So now you're reading about in the papers, right? You're reading about sleeper cells that are throughout the United States, that Hezbollah has sleeper cells in America ready to act at any time. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that we don't know if like some of these damn businesses that we identified aren't in fact the sleeper cells. And that's because we didn't, we didn't take care of them when we had an opportunity. We blew it. 
We had three major, major drug traffickers in custody overseas. Ali Fayed was in prison in the Czech Republic. Ali Fayed was a terrorist. He's one of the main like operatives for Hezbollah. And we had an extradition treaty with the Czech Republic. But unfortunately, members of the Obama administration did not engage with the Czechs. And this guy was released back to Lebanon. We had Walid Makhled in Colombia. We had General Carvajal, the head of the Venezuelan intelligence, uh, sitting in custody in Aruba. But they were released. They weren't extradited to America because people were not paying attention. They were more concerned probably with this Iran deal, you know, pallets of cash in the middle of the night to these global terrorists instead of providing support uh, to law enforcement to take down these terrorists and bring them back to America to face justice. So, yeah, Project Cassandra is near and dear to my heart and actually really, really is disturbing because when you look at what's going on now politically, it's, it's a disaster. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Derek Maltz, who is the obviously one of our top heroes um, as the former agent in charge of Special Operations Division at the DEA. Um, Derek, I can just about imagine that you and a few of your buddies are, are, are sitting in a bar having a beer um, watching the news on you know some of these things that are happening and some of these names that get thrown out and i could just about imagine the conversation over a beer and, and a cigar that you guys are having um it, it would probably start off with if only <laughs> would that be right well let's just put it this way so i have three <laughs> sons right and and what i think about is the future and the national security of america and when you look at the evolution of project cassandra in 2007, when I didn't know a thing about Hezbollah's presence in the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. James Stavridis, who was the Supreme Allied mm -hmm. Commander and the former uh, commander of this so the SOCOM down there in Florida, um, the Southern Command, which was responsible for all that region down in South America, mm -hmm. he provided me a fireball slide. And he said his worst nightmare is when Islamic terrorists and narco-terrorists come together and the next thing you know is a fireball, right? That vision was in my brain from 2007. 2008, if you watch the news and you watched the media, uh, Michael Chertoff, the, the U.S. government's uh, you know, Homeland Security Director, put out a statement that basically Hezbollah was like making Al-Qaeda look like the minor leagues. Mm -hmm. And he was right, and, correct? And basically he was right. So as a... As a senior executive in charge of the Special Operations Division, I became very concerned because we started seeing like this cocaine, you know, money laundering, you know, trade-based money laundering scheme to support Hezbollah. And I was very concerned because like this was really growing every day. And you got to remember, you know, Aman Juma was indicted for moving $200 million a month through this scheme out of the Eastern District of Virginia. And by the way, just for the public to know, he was engaged in like, what was it, 88,000 kilos of cocaine, the proceeds. He was moving mm -hmm. the proceeds of like 88,000 kilos of cocaine, whatever the hell it was. And that's just a very, very significant operation. Our undercover agent picked up $20 million in cash in Guatemala from this organization because they believed he could move money around the world. So it's a very, very significant but no one seemed to really get engaged. Like the U.S. government uh, officials like Bruce Orr and others, they really didn't seem to engage too much and try to help the DEA and the other agencies like Treasury and CBP who were working hard on this investigation. We needed to have a full court press, a unity of effort. That's the purpose of the damn threat mitigation working group. If you look at the website in the White House, both with, you know, I'm not sure about with President Trump, but President Obama, there was a threat mitigation working group. Bruce Orr was the co-chairman. And that group had a very serious responsibility to pull in the U.S. agencies together to go after this, this major terrorist threat. And it just didn't happen. I mean, we did pretty good work in that we had some great support from Treasury and we had some unprecedented actions, Patriot Act, 311 action, 
We seized $150 million out of a bank account in Lebanon, and we shut down some businesses. But the reality was we really didn't touch the trade-based money laundering scheme. And the Wall Street Journal did an investigative report uh, you know, a couple of years ago where they followed a car from one of the car dealerships that we uh, included in our, in our civil action right back to West Africa again. So mm-hmm. the business is booming. The car parks are booming all over West Africa. And we're sitting here in America, and we don't want to you know, call this what it is because it's not politically correct, right? We, we don't want to you know, get involved in that stuff. But the reality is it's a public safety disaster. Well, that's the reason I wanted you so badly on the Denise Simon experience. And I want you to know that you've got an open invitation because um, th- there's there's a thousand moving parts that I'm, I'm getting to. And and because it's a it, it's a public relations thing, it's a public safety thing, it's a national security thing. And, I, you know, we can go all the way back to Nancy Reagan when she had a problem that was, you know, uh, that she addressed that she took on was just say no. And I think that helped. That planted some DNA. But it's kind of like since then, nobody cares, Derek, when it comes to, you know, a generational problem with narcotics, do they? No. Well, that's a great point. So let me let me address that because I'm glad you brought that up. So Nancy Reagan had her Just Say No campaign, which was, I think, very effective. And if you look at when I was a kid growing up, everybody was smoking cigarettes, right? Your mother and father were smoking, your grandmother, grandfather was smoking. You were in a car and they were smoking and you were in the back seat. And you look at over the years, people recognize that like cigarettes uh, were very dangerous, you know, with cancer and everything like that. And the education went out and, you know, a lot of people stopped smoking over the years. But if you look at drugs, what happened is we just completely dropped the ball. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 9-11 hit, and, you know, we started looking at the terrorist angle and Department of Justice made preventing terrorism the number one priority. And people just automatically, you know, put aside the, the drug issues of America. And as a matter of fact, Denise, one of the big issues going on right now that the public needs to be aware of, is we have a dysfunctional system. 17 years after 9-11, we have a situation that is so broken in the sense of, Every leader in America talks about how terrorists are turning to criminal networks for funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yet our criminal investigators and our terrorist investigators are not even communicating. We have walls up 17 years after 9-11, and our government officials that are responsible for this are doing nothing about it. Like they want to make people think that this is fine, like this is normal, like everything is working great. Just look at the Boston bombing catastrophic failure of information sharing. Mm-hmm. We, had, we had a lot of intel on Tamlin and his family and their involvement in marijuana trafficking, as an example, or heroin. You know, the sister, for example, was involved with heroin uh, trafficking. And so we don't communicate because the terrorists are looking at things in the terrorism bubble the cocoon, I call it, mm-hmm. and the criminal investigators are looking at the criminal investigations, but they actually are all the same. Transnational organized crime includes terrorism. And so it's really, really bizarre to me, now that I'm retired, I look back, yes. that there's still nobody in the government that is insisting that these people break down the walls. You know, it's amazing. And if the public understood the significance of that, you know, maybe they'd be writing to their Congress people. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely, I'll give you another example. So recently, the Homeland Security Committee of America had a hearing. It was called Boston to Austin. And the Austin bombing, obviously, was very devastating. You know, a few people died with the bombs that were going off in, uh, in the neighborhoods in Austin. And obviously, the police in Austin and the chief down there did an amazing job in his leadership to pull everybody together to use all the experts that we had in Austin, Texas, to figure out who this this guy was, this maniac. And they went out and they arrested him and they prevented additional deaths, right? Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. it was great. It was a Mm -hmm. success story. But so the Congress then tries to have a hearing to show five years after Boston how well we're working together. But they failed to tell the public 
that it was like dealing with apples and oranges because in the Boston bombing, it was information that came in from the Russians in early 2011. And two years went by and there was no coordination, Mm -hmm. no synchronization of effort, no information sharing. And then the bombs went off and people died. And then, of course, after people die, law enforcement does very well to work together. Just like in Austin, they did very well Mm -hmm. after the fact. We need proactive information sharing when information comes in. So in the Boston case in 2011, if they would have shared the information with all their interagency partners, we would have been able to determine that there was drug intelligence so we could have investigated this guy, Tamlin, for his drug activities. Just like Al Capone. He was a mass murderer, <laughs> but he went down for a tax charge. Yes. Well, Derek. It's the same concept. I, I, I got to thank you, and and please know that I'm going to tap you on the shoulder and have you back because, you know, it's kind of like with you, we get the rest of the story. And yeah, exactly. the fact that and the fact that in one year that we had, we have 72,000 people that died. I mean, that, that, that's, uh, that's a scandal into itself that I don't know that we can even begin to process or comprehend. Um, think, think about it, Denise. In 9-11, which was a very, very disturbing, devastating day for America, mm-hmm. 3,000 people died, right, on one day. Right, and look what we but did. think about it. Think about it now. 72,000 yeah. have died in 2017. Thank you, Derek, and come back again soon and travel safely. And ladies and Thank gentlemen, thanks. Much. Thanks. There's more coming your way, so stay with us.